Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 1st, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, does the Alaska budget balance at current oil prices? Some think so, we don't. Second, just when we need them the most, the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation Board is starting down a very bad road. And third, in D.C., the House, with Representative Don Young supporting, votes to add $5 trillion more over the next 20 years to the national debt. And now, let's join Michael. And what we do every Tuesday is we get a chance to sit down and talk with my friend Brad Keithley, who is with a uh, who's with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He is a, he's a former oil and gas consultant. Uh, he's an attorney. He uh, and, and now he's retired, and in his retirement, he has decided to try and uh, help us out and keep us all rolling uh, in the state of Alaska. So he started Alaskans for Sustainable Budget, which is just which is just that an organization dedicated to that. We bring him in every week to talk uh, down and dirty about all these different things and get into his weekly top three. Today is no different. He joins us now. Item number one, <laughs> I, I don't even know how to unpack this. It is so, um, it, it's, it's so full of uh, falsehoods and, and everything else, but it is an article by um, Suzanne Downing from Must Read Alaska, who does some good work, but then sometimes she just runs completely off the reservation, and I think this falls definitely into the latter category. This is your number one. Let's talk about it. Well, Suzanne's article, this article, focused on the return to $80 oil, and she essentially used it as a springboard to say that, okay, the budget's back and balanced. We've, we've sort of worked through our problems. Uh, we're going to have revenues from oil now, and, and all is okay. My, my take on that is sort, sort of like George Bush in 2003 standing on the deck of the, of the aircraft carrier saying, mission accomplished. Uh, and and 15 years later, we're still in Afghanistan. I mean, it's it, it, it's wrong uh, claiming that $80 a barrel of, of oil has put the budget back in balance and we're out of the fiscal crisis uh, is just is just the wrong thing to do. There's two things that are that that are are really grind me the most about that. One is our current budget. We we didn't really lower spending during the fiscal crisis, and our current budget. We can only sustain that at eighty dollars a eighty dollars a barrel if we continue to violate the PFD statute. We took about eight hundred seven hundred fifty to eight hundred million dollars last year, diverted that from PFDs over to government in order to support government spending, high uh, elevated government spending levels. And the only way you can claim that eighty dollars gets us back in balance at at the spending levels that we've continued to have is to continue to divert that 80 that that 800 million dollars 900 million dollars away from the pfd over into government so we're not balanced uh, we're continuing to violate the pfd statute uh, uh in in these budgets and you can't claim that 80 dollars uh brings us back and all of a sudden we can pay a full up pfd if we do pay the full pfd then we've got an 800 to 900 million dollar deficit uh in the budget again but the thing that really concerns me most about this is, is to declare victory in a situation where we've drained our savings accounts 
We've drained all of the statutory budget reserve. We've drained uh, roughly $12 billion in the last five years uh, out of the constitutional budget reserve, so that it's down to less than $2 billion. It started out roughly $14 billion, and now we're down to less than $2 billion. And and all of a sudden to say, well, the, we're back up. The budget's now balanced. We can continue this spending. We've got revenues to support this spending. Um, and, and without even talking about how, refilling the constitutional budget reserve, refilling the spending accounts that we depleted, if we go back into another oil price decline, which we will, oil prices go up, oil prices go down, if we go back into another oil price decline without refilling the CBR, uh, we're going to be in, in horrible shape the next time we hit this situation. We right. sort of got through this one by having by having these savings accounts that we could pull down and support ourselves, support state spending, um, uh, support state government uh, uh, without going to you know deeper PFD cuts or taxes. We got through that because of the savings accounts. If we don't refill these savings accounts uh, as oil prices come back up, we're just going to be in horrible shape. So once you take into account the fact that we're still violating the PFD statute and that we have to set aside money uh, each year to refill the constitutional budget reserve, uh, we're not even close to being imbalanced. Well, and try to go out now and say, for candidates to try and go out now and say, oh, we're back in balance, don't worry about it, we've worked our way through this, is just, is just misleading uh, as heck, misleading the public as, 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 as much as you can be. Yeah, I mean, isn't this kind of the same song, different verse that we've heard year in and year out? Uh, you know, again, we've talked about it as the, you know, the guys on the boat where they run from one rail to the other. Uh, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're in plenty. We're in, you know, we're in, we're in shallow. We're in plenty. We're in shallow. Uh, and pretty soon they roll a boat over because they can't stop rocking back and forth. That's where they're at right now. Oh, we're in the $80 range. We're going to be just fine. Well, oil is one of the most volatile commodities on the market uh, you can't if you base a whole economy off of it you're going to be doing this forever what really though kind of baked my cookies on this was that when he was describing you know the the taxes that they held firm against and what they fought against and all this other kind of stuff i mean he described it as an irs style tax etc cetera, etc cetera. and then downing went on to say it would have also taken some 700 million dollars out of the alaska economy this year an economy that's still in a recession you want to know why the economy is still in a recession because you guys have taken the <laughs> dividend three years in a row and it has taken more than 700 million dollars out don't keep telling me you know don't 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 pee on me and tell me it's raining is what i'm saying uh you know this is this is ridiculous you guys tax the people of alaska and in fact you taxed the lowest 80 percent of income earners protecting the top 20 percent of income earners and i'm not i'm not again i'm not saying that it's bad that you're the top 20 percent income earners i'm happy for you i'm a capitalist i wish i was there but you are hurting the bottom lower the the, the lowest 80 percent of income earners in the state of alaska more than anybody else disproportionately and it is a tax sorry rant over no 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 it's no that's exactly right i mean the pfd cuts are taxes that's exactly right um and 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 even at 80 dollars given the spending levels that we've that we've continued through this uh through this entire uh, uh, fiscal situation given these spending levels we continue to have uh, a hole in the budget that has to be filled somehow. If we don't get those spending levels down, eighty dollars a barrel isn't gonna isn't gonna save us. We're gonna continue to have to have some sort of tax, whether it's a PFD tax or a progressive income tax or what you and I have talked about before on the program, a flat tax. We're gonna have to have some sort of tax uh, to continue filling filling the hole. The 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 culprit here is the spending levels. We didn't we haven't taken advantage. Of, of this fiscal situation to go in and do the hard work uh, of looking at all the categories of spending, including the formula spending levels, and bring those spending levels down. If we had done that, then $80 a barrel might bring us back to a balanced budget. But we haven't done that. The Senate's continued and the House and the governor have continued, uh, continued these spending levels. And the consequence is that $80 a barrel while it improves the situation, does not uh, get us out of this hole. And in particular, it doesn't get us out of the hole uh, that's going to be created by, by having to refill the CBR. We've drawn down the CBR by $12 billion over the past uh, four years, five years. Uh, 
even even if we take a 10-year amortization, even if we say we're going to pay that back over 10 years, that's still a billion two hundred million dollars a year, a billion two hundred million dollars a year that we have to put back uh, into the CBR that comes out of revenue. So we're not even close to balancing the budget at eighty dollars. The culprit is spending levels. If we don't get those spending levels down, we're going to continue to be in this situation uh, uh, even as oil even as oil continues to recover. Well and I want people to remember. I want the people of uh, of Fairbanks, the people of the peninsula, uh, the people of South Central I want them to remember the names of the people who have supported, for example, in this case, the taxation of the people of the state through the taking of the PFD. Stop again. This is not the victory lap. This is not the aircraft carrier landing. This is just this is a stroke of luck, which you have no control over, which may give you a little breathing room to actually make the right decision instead of screwing the people of Alaska over. And I know they don't see it that way because they don't believe it's the people's money anyway. They believe it's all government money. I mean, I, I had to laugh last night. I was driving through downtown Fairbanks and I saw a billboard or a, a political sign for Pete Kelly and it's him looking and gazing longingly up into the sky where he's like, you know, we should have limited government and the people should be free. And I'm thinking... You, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. You know, limited government. You would, I mean, I'm just, I'm not seeing it. Sorry, not buying the line. Uh, but anyway, I, I want people to do that. Brad, we're down to the last minute here. Go ahead and summate here on number one. Well, I, I, think, you, I think you've got an excellent point. And, and people need to remember, I mean, we all blame Walker for vetoing uh, the PFD. And that's, and that's exactly the right place. To, to, to have to direct that that concern. But remember the Alaska Senate, the Senate majority led by Pete Kelly and and and, and Peter Machecki and others, they were they voted to cut the PFD before Walker vetoed it. Right. The only reason that the PFD didn't get cut permanently in the twenty sixteen session is because the House stopped it. People like Lynn Gaddis and Tammy Wilson stood up and said, No, we're not going there. Uh, but the but the Senate had voted to cut it. Kelly had voted to cut it. Machecki had voted to cut it. So, yes, you're exactly right. We need to keep keep in mind the people that got us here. And Pete Kelly and Peter Machecki and the Senate majority uh, were on the lead of that effort to, to enact a PFD tax. Yep. I mean, I mean, I, and I, again, I'm not trying to put too fine a point on it, but the more I see the effect on people and I'm driving around Fairbanks and I'm seeing places that used to be open are now closed. I'm talking to people yesterday who have been saying, you know, they've had Pete, they've had friends. One guy was moving himself uh, and his family out because in part of these extra costs, it is killing this state. Stop telling me that you didn't give us a tax and that you protected us from a tax. You enabled a tax. You supported a tax. That tax was a taking of the PFD, and I'm tired of the games and the shenanigans. Uh, sorry, Brad, didn't mean to run over you. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're going to continue here in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. Again, sorry about that, Brad. I didn't mean to uh, run you over on that. I just, it just, I'm just, I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little grumpy about that. Let me just put it that way. Especially after taking a tool around town yesterday. You're you're up in an area where, where that's sort of ground zero, right? Where Pete and uh, and and uh, Kawasaki's race are, are is is gonna is gonna just bring that that issue to the fore. So I can understand it. I mean, driving around seeing those seeing those signs will trigger that. And I think that's always been the challenge with people like Pete Kelly because he has always believed. Uh, it's my impression anyway that he has always believed that the dividend is welfare that it is just state money, it's just largesse that we could give when we could afford it, and now we should just be happy that we're going to get whatever it is that we're going to get and stop squawking about it. Uh, that seems to be, you know, that's my impression of his reaction to it. Uh, kind of the same thing for Machiki. I mean, it's regrettable that we have to do it, but we've got to do it for the good of the people. Uh, and again, affecting the lowest 80% of income earners, and specifically the lowest 20% of income earners, disproportionately more than anybody else in the entire state. I just, I mean, it is a tax. There is no two ways about it. Yeah, it's uh, and when you run the numbers, when, when you run the numbers on a family of four, the effect of the PFD cuts on the top 20% is less than 2%. It's a less than 2% tax. When you run it on the second, third, and, and fourth, uh, 20%. Uh, it grows to uh, 
ten percent, twelve percent, and then it gets to like a twenty five to thirty percent tax on a on a family of four when you get to the to the lowest uh, to the lowest twenty percent of income earners. It, it's it's a way. I mean, the PFD cut has been a way to tax Alaskans in a way that avoids taxing the twenty percent or limits the tax limits the impact on the top twenty percent. Right. That's that's what uh, GCI wanted when they originally started advocating for PFD cuts. That's what Walker's given into. That's what the Alaska Senate went down the road doing. And it ha- it saved the top twenty percent, but it's been at the expense of a tax, an increasingly uh, uh, a large tax on on the other eighty uh, percent as you go down through the income brackets. We got through one of our weekly top three, which means we're going to have to pick up the pace here. Sorry, Brad. I, I bloviated and ranted on you there. But uh, you've got uh, two and three in the wings. Let's talk about uh, number two here. Number two is a decision by the Permanent Fund Corporation Board last Friday to start setting aside a portion of the Permanent Fund investment pool to focus specifically on investments in Alaska with Alaska businesses and through Alaska uh, investment companies. Uh, the initial step is about 200 million or so uh, to focus on Alaska businesses, and the, and the second step is over the over a span of a few years to build up to five percent of the of the investment pool being directed through an Alaska investment companies. I I am very concerned, uh, and I believe it's a mistake for the permanent fund board to go down this road. On the surface, it sounds nice. Yes, we're taking this money. We're going to invest in Alaska businesses. But we already have an agency that does that. The Alaska Industrial Development Export Authority, ADA, uh, is charged with doing exactly that, investing, helping, financing Alaska businesses to to develop and grow and become uh, contributors to the economy. The permanent fund is envisioned as something entirely different. The permanent fund has been envisioned to go out and get the maximum possible return on the permanent fund uh, and and generate the maximum possible earnings, both for the benefit of Alaskans through the PFD and for the benefit of uh, through uh, to state government through generating the other 50 percent of the earnings that the Governor Hammond had in mind right. uh, to, to give those to, to, to give those to government when when government needs it. To do that, the Permanent Fund Corporation needs it should not, not have, have blinders, blinders on that says you've got to take a portion of this money and put it in a given geographic area uh, to help out that area, sort of regardless of what the return consequences are. To do that, the Permanent Fund Corporation needs to look globally, as they have, uh, and identify the best opportunities out there in the world. Now, if one of those opportunities was in Alaska, that would be great. But to set aside a portion of the fund and say we're, we're going to have to dedicate it to Alaska and hope that the returns are going to be commensurate with what we can get on get elsewhere in the world, that's frankly just a subsidy. That's using the Permanent Fund Corporation to subsidize uh, uh, Alaska businesses. And that's that's going down a very bad road. Right. That's starting to take the permanent fund and and sort of give it over to the top twenty. Well, uh, top twenty percent. Give, give it, it over to the businesses in Alaska instead of using it for the people. It, I mean, it politicizes the fund. That's really what it does. Is yeah. it politicizes the permanent fund? And uh, I know Hammond talked about this in in. Uh, uh, both the uh, Tales of an Alaskan Bush Rat and Diapering the Devil, he talks about boondoggles and how it would be, you know, the cronies would be, you know, giving their friends or investing in loans. And, you know, all you have to do is look at the wisdom of the state of Alaska in the, vest- in the investments that the state has made so far, terminals and granaries and Matanuska and, I mean, all the, you know, dairies and, I mean, all these things that they've invested in that have all gone bust. Is that what you want to do with your dollars? See a few people get rich off the investments, flip it, turn it, and then have the whole thing crash and burn? I mean, that's not what the fund is about. Now, Governor Hammond's quote uh, in Diapering the Devil was, in the past, uh, and this is what he was uh, this is what he was trying to avoid with the permanent fund corporation quote in the past those who knew how to play the game were able to secure subsidies for their pet projects many times at the collective expense of all other alaskans and that's exactly what my concern is here and others concern is here that we're going to have i mean we're unleashing lobbyists now in the permanent fund corporation to go argue hey you know this investment up in up in toke would be a great investment uh, for the permanent fund corporation and yeah it sort of helps 
puts out my client. But, you know, politically, that's really the right thing to do. And we're turning, you're exactly right, we're turning the Permanent Fund Corporation into a into into yet another subsidy generating uh, uh, lobbying friends uh, 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 borrowing uh, operation. ADA uh, is something that we've had set up for a long time. We have a lot of rules around ADA. We have very strict uh, 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 protections against that sort of, of lobbying, but that's what ADA does. It helps Alaska businesses. It helps finance Alaska businesses. We don't need two agencies doing the same thing. We need the Permanent Fund Corporation staying on, on focus, on, on, uh, with a laser focus on what it's supposed to be doing, which is generating maximum returns uh, for the benefit uh, of Alaskans and Alaska government, not subsidizing a portion of Alaskans and creating a few Alaska jobs, but at the expense of getting the best overall return for all, all Alaskans. I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Again, all I can see is look at the track record, see how we've done so far. It's very pathetic. And if you start playing with the billions of dollars in the permanent fund, instead of focusing on their main priority, which is supposed to be the biggest return possible for the fund itself, that is, in my opinion, a mistake. I mean, I just, you know, and I, and I agree. Final thoughts on, uh, on this, Brad? I'm going to let you wrap up. We're about uh, seven minutes out, six minutes out. Well, final, final thoughts on the permanent fund, fund is, 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 frankly, this is a consequence of having a permanent fund board that's appointed by the governor, uh, has members of the administration on it, uh, and doesn't go through Senate confirmation. I think as we go down the road on the permanent fund and we talk about constitutionalizing the permanent fund dividend, we need to change the, the structure of this board and at least have it subject to Senate confirmation or have it subject to legislative confirmation so we take the politics and, and the governor's ability to use the permanent fund as sort of his own personal slush fund, we need to take the politics out of that. And I think legislative confirmation is one step in that. And I, and I couldn't agree more. Again, that although we've seen with the confirmation hearings now on the national level, politics always finds a way in, it seems like. It seems to be the answer. Politics always wends its way in. All right, let's move on to number three, which I think takes us to the national level. But again, it is uh, an indicator, and we, we've talked about this and before. This is, you know, symptoms of a disease that the patient is sick. Uh, we're seeing the same thing at the national level, and of course, all the various states, to some degree or another, some more than others, have picked up on this disease and caught it, which is the overspending, the the laxity in in the way that they do taxes and kind playing fast and loose with the with the rules you of course are talking about the new tax cuts 2.0 right and that's that's a proposal that just passed the house don young and voted fa voted in favor of it to cut uh individual taxes um, even further than than the tax proposal last December did. We're, we're all in favor of cutting taxes, but you can't cut revenue streams uh, without cutting spending. And what this bill does is, is in, in fact, they even suspended the rules that required offsetting spending cuts when they passed this bill. What this bill does is cut about uh, over over the first 10 years, cut about $650 billion out of the revenue stream. When you look at it over a 20-year period, it cuts about $5 trillion uh, out of our revenue stream. But there's no offsetting spending cuts. So it, it grows national debt. We have current national debt is about $20 trillion. It adds about 25% on top of, of national debt that we currently have over the course of uh, over the course of 20 years, we have uh, a, uh, a, a our current deficit annual deficit uh, at the federal budget is growing to about a trillion dollars. It adds uh, additional uh, money uh, on the annual deficit above and beyond that. Uh, all of which would be okay if we had offsetting spending cuts that were going to you know, reduce the spending requirement uh, at least to match uh, the amount of revenue that, that we're cutting out of here. But, but we don't. I mean, there's a rule that's called the pay-go rule that you have to pay as you go in making uh, these sorts of revenue cuts or in making additional spending. You have to, you have to up revenue to get, to get additional spending. This bill specifically suspended 
the pay-go rule rules uh, with respect to these tax cuts. So all it's doing is increase. All these tax cuts are doing is increasing national debt, borrowing money that future Americans are going to have to pay off, so that this American generation can have yet an even better life, but at the expense of future American generations. And it's just sending us deeper and deeper into the hole. Tax cuts are fine. But you've got to have spending cuts that go with them, and this house, continue, uh, the House, continued to put, uh, continues to put revenue reductions ahead of any consideration of spending reductions. And it's just, it's just the wrong way to go. We're digging our hole deeper and deeper and deeper. But, but wait, Brad. I mean, you know, wage growth is up. It's at the highest ever. You know, unemployment's uh, rising. I mean, the the economy's in, a, in the thing. Well, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna make up for it, Brad. It's all gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna happen. <laughs> Yeah, the economists the economists have looked at that, and their estimate is that that uh, uh, economic growth generated by this by this tax cut will pay for about 14 percent of the tax cut. That's factored into the into the 600 million dollars over the 10 years, and into the five trillion dollars over the over the over the 20 years. Uh, there will be some economic growth, but but it's 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 less than 20 percent. It's less than 15 percent uh, of the cost of the bill. That's that's the extent of the revenue cut. You have to you have to match spending cuts, spending cuts, actual spending cuts, not not I'm going to talk about making spending cuts later on type stuff, but actual spending cuts in order to make this tax bill, uh, this tax cut uh, pencil out at zero. And and Congress just isn't doing it. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, you could find uh, his link up on my Facebook page, or you can just go to Facebook and search up Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, we appreciate you uh, coming uh, coming out, and uh, we'll have to go to Fairbanks someday together and go catch a concert or something. I know that's uh, music is your big thing, and and I love doing that. So uh, maybe one of these days we'll do it together, and we'll get a chance to actually talk to the people face to face here together, and and maybe we could stir the pot a little more. How about that? I look forward to it, Michael. I, I always look forward to opportunities to come to Fairbanks, and, and I'd look forward to it, especially if we can couple that with, with talking on the program. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brad Keithley. Again, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're going to continue ahead here in just a moment. We've got more coming up. Don't go anywhere. It is The Michael Duke Show, your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio, heard live around the world at MichaelDukeShow.com. Back with more right after this. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.